In any event, we're uh, very privileged to have uh, Anne here tonight. She's going to speak for about 40 to 45 minutes uh, on as a theologian, uh, and then we will have uh, Ken Miller. Now I'm even more nervous about going to Geneva. <laughs> I forgot the Servetus thing. I'd like to forget the Servetus thing at the Calvin Scholar. I was just thinking it would be like I walked today where Calvin walked. <laughs> it is wonderful to be with you all to be a part of this very exciting seminar on open theology and science. I have had the unsettling experience since arriving here of thinking some new thoughts. <laughs> and it's entirely the fault of the gathered group uh, hearing your articulate and winsome introduction of alternative points of view. Um, and these new thoughts would not be so bad except that they're disturbing my old thoughts. So before I begin, I want to make a personal comment lest when you hear a fairly heavy critique of the intelligent design approach, you assume that I discount every teleological approach whatsoever. I have decided, and this is as of yesterday, <laughs> that I would affirm in nature evolutionary trends, even directionality, and think we may with some justification make theological inferences to progress and even purpose. Uh, these latter two, progress and purpose, I know that's contestable. Uh, from some points of view, evolution toward the human being does not represent progress. Um, in the work of ecology, um, in terms of ecological value, it's been pointed out that maggots probably do a lot more for their environment than human beings, and that, in fact, there's something of a threat there. But, nevertheless, we do see a kind of progress from non-life to life to conscious life to self-conscious life and even to God-conscious life. To a process theologian's eyes, it looks suspiciously like divine initial aims, divine luring is having its fruition in ever greater diversity and complexity, enhanced social, relational existence. It appears as if the world is um, itself created and unfolding as it is, nevertheless, under the influence, under the divine influence. This far, I think I can go out on the teleological limb. But I'm brought up short um, when I come upon intelligent design, and to that we now turn. Intelligent design um, affirms that certain features of the universe and of living things are best explained by an intelligent cause, not an undirected process such as natural selection. In particular, those instances of irreducible complexity, specified complexity and fine-tuning that makes life as we know it possible. These things commend themselves to ID proponents. Um, and put simply, it's the improbability of those things um, occurring through chance or through natural selection that they believe gives them reason to infer intelligent design. ID is a, is a particular slice of a very old and very respectable argument. And I think a brief historical survey of the argument from design is a helpful way to frame that peculiar, particular uh, manifestation. So I'll, I'll proceed with that, a race through history. Um, I would not have us view the rich and varied history of the argument from design through the lens of this contemporary rendition, which I take to be deeply problematic, scientifically and theologically. But nature's apparent design, as seen in the order and beauty of the heavens, the anatomy and physiology of creatures, <coughs> the suitability of the environment to support life, that has long been and will continue to be a source of wonder to all and to many a pointer toward a creator God. 
We see the argument regularly arise historically and face challenges and with a remarkable resilience simply reformulate itself in response to challenges. It predates Christian sources. Cicero in 45 BCE in his book on the nature of the gods actually presented both sides uh, of the argument in a form that's strangely familiar to our ears. Speaking for the Stoics, he poses the question, when we see a mechanism such as a planetary model or a clock, do we doubt that it is the work of a conscious intelligence? So how can we doubt that the world is the work of the divine intelligence? Then he lays out the other point of view, which the atomists were arguing. And they said, the world is made by natural processes without any need of a creator. Atoms come together and are held together by mutual attraction. No need for intelligent design or a designer needs to be postulated. Moving on to the Middle Ages, the argument gets freshly elaborated when Aristotelian physics is rediscovered with its four types of causes, efficient, material, uh, formal, final. As the argument goes, if there's a formal cause that is a design, uh, there must be a final cause, a designer. A design without a designer is a, a strange thing indeed. Then uh, Thomas Aquinas works this out in his five ways. Uh, the structure of his argument is very much shaped by Aristotelian physics um, and the then prevalent assumption that an effect cannot be greater than the cause. It was also assumed that something can be known about the cause from the effect. His argument proceeds a posteriori from observable effects, such as the odd fact that the planets move, even though they're not conscious and therefore can't move themselves. Uh, something must be moving them. And since there can't be an infinite regress, um, it all has to stop somewhere with an unmoved mover who is gone. Formidable challenges to that form of the argument for design arise when Newton discovers the physical laws of motion and, and can explain the movement of the spheres without recourse to divine intervention to move them around in space. But rather than allowing this to count against the argument from design, Newton himself reformulates it. He proclaims God the architect of those physical laws that explain the motion of the planets. 18th century, we're, we're moving right along here. 18th century, we come to William Paley, uh, who reformulates the argument from design by attending to specific instances of design. He takes the eye as a case in point, and the way in which various parts of the eye cooperate in a very complex way to produce sight. Such adaptation of means to ends, he claims, requires that we postulate an intelligent designer. As he argues, it's as if we were walking along a heath and we came to a watch. Uh, rather than assume that the watch had come together by chance or natural processes, we would assume there was an intelligent designer that put it together. Well, Paley's argument was challenged by Hume in the dialogue concerning natural religion, specifically for privileging human artifacts as the analog, which of course had designers. Then, with the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, the view met its most decisive challenge. The theory of evolution offered a genuine alternative explanation to apparent design in organisms. After Darwin, we're no longer left with mere chance on the one hand or intelligent design on the other. We have an answer to why specific species exist in such marvelous diversity and complexity and so well adapted to their environments. As Richard Dawkins quipped, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. 